Oh, and I'll turn on the, uh, we now have the auto transcript, the captioning. Oh, That's awesome. Interesting, yeah. Hi, welcome everyone. Welcome, welcome. So many of you pouring in at once, we love it. We are gonna give it a little bit of time to let people come into the room and join us and um, we'll get started soon. And hello on Facebook, we're streaming live there too. We see you there, welcome. Welcome everyone, welcome live on Facebook. Thank you for joining us today. Welcome, welcome. We'll give it another minute or so. We did have a lot of registrations for this workshop. <clears throat> I know not everybody shows up, but I do want to give people a little bit of, of time to join us. Appreciate you taking time in your busy afternoons in the middle of the week to join us. That means a lot to us. Thank you. Oh, if you, there are a few things in the chat, if you, oh, no, you reposted, wonderful, thank you. Ignore me. <laughs> uh, welcome everyone. Well, I think let's go ahead and get started. Um, my name is Wing, I work with the City of Portland. I'm one of the coordinators of the Fix Affairs, which are a City of Portland event. Um, normally we'd be in person a few times through the winter um, with, a, whole bunch of community resource partners and workshops and repair and tabling and since the pandemic we've been bringing you online workshops similar to what we would have in person at the fairs we hope to return next season uh, to in-person events knock on whatever this material is that didn't just curse it so uh with on that note one of our amazing partners lisa from montevilla farmers market is here to um Get us started. Hi, Lisa. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much for having us. My name is Lisa. I use she, her pronouns, and I am the manager at Montevilla Farmers Market, which is a year-round market in Southeast Portland, and I'm part of the Cook First Portland team. So welcome to part two of our Fixin' to Cook series, where we will learn all about sauces. Um, our previous videos demonstrating seasonal soup recipes, as well as the recipes that you'll see today, can be found on our website, cookfirstpdx.org. Um, we will have one more demonstration on April 7th that will be highlighting spring greens. Please type any questions you have in the chat if you're on Zoom or in the comments if you're on Facebook Live. We have one of our guest chefs here today, Nico, who will be able to answer all of your questions at the end. So thank you so much for joining us and we hope you enjoy the demonstrations. A bit with your snap card. Um, hey, I'm Allie from Montevillo Farmer's Market and I wanted to give you a little rundown of our double up food box. Uh, benefit with your SNAP card. Um, so if you come to the market, you can take out your SNAP money um, or EBT cash and you'll get tokens. So you'll receive your tokens and you can use those at the market. And we'll also match up to $20 every market, um, once per market. And we'll give you these little cards that you can use. And this is called Double Up Food Bucks. 
And you can use these double up the books to buy fruits, vegetables, mushrooms, beans, nothing that's processed or um, no hot food or alcohol, but any fresh foods you can use um, these to buy that with. There are multiple mar markets around the city and the state that you can use your benefits. So if you want to find out more about the other markets or other ways that you can use your SNAP benefits, visit doubleuporegon.org and you can find all the information there. All right, we are so excited today to bring you um, Cook First plus Montevilla Farmers Market have teamed up for the Fix It Fair and today is Fixing to Cook Soup. And we're starting out with a wonderful um, vegetable lentil soup that Montevilla Farmers Market Assistant Manager Ali Neary is here to share with you all. Welcome, Ali. Okay, so today we are making a vegetable lentil soup. I am so sorry, everyone. I uh, had the wrong video queued up. Give me just a second and I'll get that going. My apologies. All right, today in the kitchen, we have a couple guest chefs making some beautiful sauces. And so we wanted to prepare just a simple um, winter vegetable roast that those sauces will go beautifully on top of. So I've chopped my root vegetables here. Um, I have rutabaga is my smallest chunk because those are gonna cook, take the longest to cook and I want all of these to cook at the same time. So I chop my rutabaga small and then I've got big chunks of orange carrot I had like a yellow carrot potato and beets down at the bottom so equal sized chunks of the carrot beets and potato and a little bit smaller chunks of the rutabaga because they normally take a little bit longer to cook I've got my oven preheating at 400. I'm going to spread out my roots, give them a drizzle of olive oil, some salt, and pepper. You could do all these things to your taste, to your liking. Um, vegetables at this size are going to take about 35 minutes. Um, to roast. You could always cut them smaller and they'll cook quicker, but I like these big chunky vegetables. I think they'll go, they'll be nice big bites to go with our sauces that our guest chefs are going to prepare today. So you could toss this in a separate bowl, but I'm going to toss it with olive oil, salt, and pepper just right on the sheet pan. You get a little bit fewer dishes. Um, we don't want the veggies to be packed too tight um, on the sheet pan, so I realize once I get my cabbage on here, that's going to kind of um, get the roots too close together, so I'm going to take off just a couple handfuls. Um, if you had a separate sheet pan, you could use a separate sheet, but this will just make it so that then there's nice even spacing around the roots, which will help in the roasting process. If they're too tight, they won't roast in the same nice browned way. So I've got over here on this side of my pan, I've got my olive oily and salt and pepper hands. Might need a little bit more olive oil, salt and pepper. I'll just pour it right on my pan. 
and roll, I'll do pepper at the end, roll my cabbages around in it. So get these roasted along at the same time with the root veggies. So these are all gonna go into the oven together, a one pan roast at 400 degrees for about 35 minutes, like halfway through at 15 minutes, we'll check them and give them a little stir and I'll actually flip over these cabbage um, wedges as best I can. So our oven, we're waiting for it to get up to temperature. All right, our, um, our oven is preheated to 400 degrees. I'm going to get these veggies, winter veggies, in the oven. Um, we'll check them in about 15 minutes. We'll give it a stir and I'll flip over the cabbages. All right, my sheet pan veggies have been in for 15 minutes. So I'm gonna pull them out and just give them a stir and put them back in for probably another 20. You can see they're nice and steamy and starting to roast. They're releasing a lot of moisture, but that's okay, it'll roast off. So give them a toss and then separate them back out. Remember, we don't want the roasted veggies to be too close to one another. And then these cabbage, I'm just gonna try to give them a flip. So the other side, opposite side, is face down on the pan. We're just gonna get them in, back in the oven and let them keep roasting for probably 20 more minutes. And then they'll be ready for our sauces. Um, today, we are so excited to have a special guest um, in our kitchen. Nikki Guerrero is here um, from Hot Mama Salsa. Um, doing wonderful products at the farmer's market and in your local grocer and she'll get to talk a little bit about that but also we want you to know she is a home cook a member of our cook first team um, and home cook extraordinaire cooking for her family all the time cooking for friends you're gonna want to try this dish yourself at home or figure out how to get invited over to her house we are pleased to welcome Nikki to the kitchen today thank you Nikki Thanks, Heather. Hi, everybody. Um, so we're, I'm gonna make some stuff today that I make all the time at home. And we roast vegetables all the time at our house because it's one way my kid will eat them, especially cabbage and cauliflower. Um, and so this is, we're gonna start with a sauce that is actually an add-on to my fish sauce Caesar dressing that I make all the time. So we're gonna actually make the Caesar dressing first and turn it into a sauce for roasted vegetables. So it's two sauces in one today. So we're gonna start with garlic. And normally I make this at home in my tiny Cuisinart, but it's really easy to make without any kind of machinery. So that's what we're gonna do today for the demo. So this, Clove of garlic is giant, so I'm only gonna use one. I smack it to get the to get the skin loose. Oh, it was actually two cloves in what looked like one. So I'm gonna use two cloves or one giant clove. And I like to just get rid of that little hard bottom. And then I'm gonna just mince it up. And I'm using this plastic cutting board on top of the wood cutting board because we're really gonna smash up this garlic and make a paste. And we don't want the wood cutting board absorbing all the garlic flavor because if you do that, the next time you go to cut an apple on your cutting board, it's gonna have a little bit of garlic flavor to it. So I'm just mincing, slicing, and mincing a little bit. I'm gonna move this to my trash pile. And then once I have it a little bit minced, I'm gonna add some salt. So a good pinch, I'm gonna add into, 
onto the garlic and I'm gonna take my knife and I'm gonna just use the side of it and put some pressure on it and kind of scrape it along. So that salt is the abrasive that mashes, that helps to like mash and break down the garlic. And I'll do a combo of kind of min mincing it and smashing it. So the first time I ever saw this technique, I was uh, traveling in Cuba with a friend of mine and we were staying at this family house and the grandmother would sit at the table all morning doing prep work and she would do this until it was like totally like this amazing paste. It was like whipped garlic by the time she was done. And I always imagined her hands probably always smelled like garlic. She did it every morning. So really, the more you get this broken down, the less like garlic chunks you're gonna have in your sauce. So you don't really want to bite into, you know, a big chunk of garlic. Unless you love garlic. Then do it as chunky as you want. Okay, so I'm gonna mash it one more time and then we're gonna add it to our bowl. And I'm gonna give you measurements today, but honestly, I eyeball everything and taste. So feel free to do the same. All right, so we're gonna put it into our mixing bowl here. Hold on, that has a little water in it. Garlic in. We're gonna take the juice of a lemon, which I'm gonna roll just to release the uh, juice, make it easier to juice. And I just do it in my hand so that I catch any of the seeds. And I kind of roll the lemon around as I'm squeezing it. And then I catch the seeds. And this helps kind of clean the garlic off my fingers too. Oh, look at me, I just put those seeds back in there. That's not where you're supposed to dump the seeds, dump them off to the side. And then add to that a little bit of rice wine, or sorry, rice vinegar, and I use the unseasoned kind. I use a ta I'm gonna use a tablespoon today. And then use a good fish sauce. And I'm gonna use about half a teaspoon of fish sauce in this. But um, this is what gives it the umami flavor for your Caesar. So you can add more if you like more or add less if you don't like it. But it really gives it the Caesar flavor. So you do need that fish sauce. Um, and now I'm gonna use about four tablespoons of mayo. Okay, and then we're gonna whisk it. Little pinch of salt. And if you um, want it thinner, you can add more vinegar or more lemon. I'm gonna add just a little bit of pepper. So here's what we're working with so far. And you can see it's not super thick, but it's not real thin either. And you know, every lemon is gonna give you kind of a different amount. I'm gonna say I want a little bit more juice. I want it a little thinner to start. And you can use this dressing too for your roasted vegetables. Caesar is great. Anything kind of salty and briny. Okay, so now I'm gonna taste it. It's so good. And so easy, right? So this you can use on your salad, you can use it on your roast vegetables. We're gonna now make it into a sauce for the roast vegetables that Heather's been making. So this is one of our hot sauces. It's our fermented Fresno hot sauce. So this one is really great to mix with mayo and um, it adds a pungent, 
fruity, spicy flavor, but also a little sweetness because we use white balsamic vinegar in this. So the sweetness is going to balance the, the nuttiness of the tahini. So we're going to put a tablespoon of this in the Caesar. Now, this one is really not crazy spicy. So that may seem like a lot of hot sauce, but it really doesn't make the sauce too spicy at all. And then the tahini, we're gonna go in and do about two tablespoons. And tahini is just um, sesame seed paste. So you can actually make this on your own too if you have sesame seeds. You can toast them up and grind them. But this is just adds such a rich, nutty flavor and it's really gonna thicken our sauce too. So I'm just eyeballing about two tablespoons because I don't want to dip my mayonnaise spoon in my tahini. And I did roast some cauliflower last night and I tested this sauce to make sure I had the uh, measurements down and everyone loved it. Super good. So that's it. You just mix those two things into the fish sauce Caesar and you can see how it's a little bit thicker. And um, I, you can drizzle it over your roast vegetables. One thing I like to do if I'm having people over and make it fancy is smear it on the bottom of your plate and then pile your roasted vegetables on top and put a little bit of fresh herbs and it look, makes it look fancy. All right, our roasted veggies are coming out of the oven. Um, they've been in here at 400 degrees for 45 minutes. We wanted to let that cabbage and the roots get nice and crispy, and they did. So this was 45 minutes, and we flipped the cabbage and gave the roasted veggies a stir about halfway through. Yum, these look delicious. So I'm gonna plate them up with our sauce that we made. And I'm gonna start with the cabbage because we want to kind of keep that together. The crispy cabbage is the best. So don't be afraid to get that color on there. Okay, and then I'm gonna put the, I'm just gonna kind of sprinkle the veg all around. It's gonna look nice. Pretty colors with the beets and the carrots. I guess maybe grab a spatula when you get it out and loosen everything. It'll make it easier to dump it out on your platter. Because sometimes it'll stick on there. Okay, so now we have the vegetables. I'll plate it up. Doesn't that look pretty? And then we're just gonna spoon our sauce over. Just drizzle it around and then you can reserve a little extra and put an extra side dish out for people who want more. Ooh, it smells good when it hits the hot vegetables. You can really smell the sauce. Lunch is ready. <laughs> so if you wanted, I wanted to mention that if you wanted to make this sauce vegan, you can do so without the fish sauce. Just add a little more rice vinegar and lemon until it tastes good to you. Hola, soy Nico, un vegan chef de Perú. I learned to cook Peru's comida criolla from my mom. That is the Creole food, 500 year fusion of indigenous, European, African, Chinese, and Japanese cultures and ingredients. Now, my mission is to veganize Peru's cuisine using plant-based ingredients that celebrate this multicultural heritage. 
the heart of Peru's Creole cuisine is the native ingredients that indigenous Quechua people have cultivated for thousands of years at high elevations in the Andes Mountains of Peru. There, communities thrive on plant-forward diets of potatoes, quinoa, corn, tomatoes, hot peppers, and wild herbs. There's also a sacred connection to the land. Quechua people make offerings of gratitude to Pachamama, Mother Earth, for their harvest. They also use the earth as a cooking vessel itself. They bury potatoes in underground earthen ovens to slow cook and bake. Cooking connects me with my Quechua ancestors. And here in Portland, as an immigrant in these indigenous lands of the Pacific Northwest, I cook using local ingredients from farmers markets and producers so that I can make dishes with Peruvian roots. So let's prepare two sauces from the Andes Mountains of Peru to accompany seasonal roasted vegetables. What makes these sauces vegan is the addition of plain unsweetened plant-based yogurt and milk. First, I'll make uchucuta, an ají verde sauce, where the blend of parsley, mint, and cilantro remind me of the aroma of huacatay, the wild mint from Peru. Then I'll cook huancaina sauce, a spicy, creamy, and cheesy sauce from the town of Huancayo, with a base of garlic, onion, and ají amarillo, a yellow hot pepper from Peru that's all thickened with saltine crackers. I'm cooking with roasted purple potatoes from Peru, and for the sauces, we'll have garlic, lime juice, jalapeno hot pepper, red onion, mint, cilantro, parsley, lettuce for garnish, some salt, ají amarillo hot pepper, saltine crackers, nutritional yeast, turmeric, peanut butter, plant-based yogurt, and milk. All right, so first, we're gonna chop some lettuce for garnish and I stack them one on top of the other and then to thin slices. Next, I'm gonna chop half an onion. Cut off the end of the onion opposite the roots. Place it flat on the cutting board. Slice it in half. Peel one of the layers off. And we begin slicing from the top of the root down to the flat part. And we slice that piece in half. And flip both halves down and slice again. Rotate the pieces and finish chopping the onion. And next, let's chop the jalapeno. I take off both ends, cut it lengthwise, and then carefully remove the seeds and the veins with a spoon. I'm gonna put them face down, cut them into strips, and cut into small squares. Okay, next we're going to cook the base, the onion aderezo for the huancaina sauce. I'm gonna heat up some cooking oil and saute the chopped onion. And to that, we add the garlic. and stir for a few minutes until the onions become translucent. And now we add the ají amarillo.
I got the bright yellow color. Mmm. Heat from the spices. And the hot pepper. Listo. Now, let's blend all the ingredients for the ají verde uchucuta sauce. The cilantro and parsley and mint and the jalapeno, hot peppers we chopped, some water, plant-based yogurt, peanut butter, freshly squeezed lime juice, and a little bit of salt. And here we have the Uchucuta Aji Verde sauce. Uchucuta in Quechua means ground hot peppers. And in the Andes Mountains of Peru, Indigenous people make this sauce using a large stone batan, a large stone mortar and pestle batan. Next, let's blend the huancaina sauce. We have the onion adreso with the ají amarillo, the plant-based yogurt, plant-based milk, saltine crackers, and nutritional yeast. And now we're ready to plate. We have an ají verde uchucuta sauce with mint, parsley, cilantro, and jalapeño. and a huancaina sauce with an onion and a ji amarillo adreso base. Over roasted purple potatoes from Peru grown in Oregon. Great, and we are back. So thank you, Nico and Nikki, for um, those amazing demonstrations. If anyone has any questions, please type them in the chat. We have Nico here live um, to answer questions for y'all. I can go ahead and start off. I have a question for myself. Um, I'm curious if you have um, a gluten-free version uh, for folks who don't have gluten, uh, like a replacement for the saltine crackers. Uh, great question. I haven't tried it, but I think you could also try maybe a gluten-free bread instead of the crackers. Mm -hmm. um, anything to thicken would be the key here. Um, I, I have I actually done different sauce with the gluten-free bread for a friend that uh, needed that. So I think that would work, yeah. Nice. Would you want to add maybe a little bit more salt? Because the exactly. saltines? Cool. You know, all of these recipes are a template. I, I recommend and I always, like Nikki said in her video, I, I grew up cooking by taste, right? So mm -hmm. recipes are a template before plating or serving. Grab a separate spoon, taste, and then adjust. Maybe a little bit more heat, a little bit more citrus for brightness, or a little bit more salt. Yeah. Nice. We have a question from Jerry. Um, how long do the sauces keep? Great questions. I, I usually use them right away um, because they are blended. And for example, the, the sauce that has the mint and the parsley, uh, those tend to go a little bit faster. So I wouldn't do them more than a day in advance. Um, I, I try to use them right away. 
they also separate after a little bit just because of the blending, right? Do you think these sauces could be uh, frozen at all, like put in little containers and frozen? I think so. Yeah, I haven't tried that, but I think so. Yes. Cool. Um, let's see. Jerry's also asking um, where can they find the purple potatoes specifically? Yeah. Um, you know, I, I shop at different uh, farmers markets throughout Portland, and I've seen them at least in two. I don't remember exactly which ones, but I was very surprised and pleasantly surprised. I said, wow, these are from Peru. And I talked to the, the producer and they said that, yeah, they, they grow them. So, um, so they, yeah, they are available. I think the last one for, for this demo, I got them at a supermarket, but I asked and they are from Oregon. So uh, nice. I was very, very happy about that. Cool. Yeah, and I'm pretty sure specifically last Sunday at the Monteville Farmers Market, I'm pretty sure Crooked Furrow had um, the purple fleshed potatoes. I don't remember exactly what the variety was called, but um, yeah, a lot of different farmers grow them. Um, great. I was curious, uh, could you or have you ever used different herbs um, than the three that you had in that one recipe? For that particular recipe, no, but um, I think a lot of different aromatics could work, right? So it's almost like a creamy pesto, if you will. So if you had maybe, you know, spinach instead of something else or uh, basil, that might also work. I think the idea is to introduce freshness and greens to go with the hot peppers, right? Uh, but the aromatics of mint are, are very specific, right? Very unique and and as I mentioned in the video and in the recipe, you, you really can't get wakatai, which is the wild mint from Peru mm -hmm. here. So I, that's why I like the blend of parsley, cilantro and mint, which is pretty readily available in any market. So, uh, but I encourage uh, cooks to improvise, you know, to find something that they like, maybe a different aromatic that works. Um, so many possibilities. Cool. Wonderful. Let's see, um, Beth asks, which mint were you using? Were you using like a, a peppermint or spearmint? Do you happen to know? Uh, just the most common mint that you would get at a market. Just like a culinary mint, that makes yeah. sense. Cool. But again, um, you know, if you want something sharper, maybe try the peppermint. You know, I think mm -hmm. and, and anything, anything is possible. It's being creative, uh, I think it's the name of the game in the kitchen. That's great, I love that quote. Um, could you use a different nut butter than peanut butter or is the peanut flavor um, pretty important? Uh, again, yeah, I think creativity is essential in the kitchen. If you have a different nut butter and almond butter, um, the reason I use the peanut butter is because, well, peanuts are one of the native ingredients in South America and Peru. So uh, it reminds me of the flavors there. A lot of stews in Peru have uh, crushed peanuts. So using a peanut butter is an easy addition to, to that, but different creamy, savory, protein-laden uh, components could work instead of the peanuts. So absolutely, yeah. Let's see. Um, one question is, what are you excited about buying in the farmer's market right now, and what would you do with it? Oh, my goodness. <laughs> um, well, I, <laughs> we, we, still, we haven't made it in, in a few weeks, but I do like to go uh, to the markets with the family. Um, we just pick whatever's in season, right? So I think that that's, that's the key. It's, it's, it's a little bit of an adventure. I, I don't necessarily have something in mind when, when we show up at the market. We, we walk around, do the entire round at least once, and then maybe the second time, talk to different producers and pick different things and see what is at the peak of the season, right? There's many cultures in, in Peru, for example, we have a, a, a indigenous, European, African, Chinese, and Japanese cultures that all come together for this Creole, Comida Criolla fusion. And the word that comes to mind right now is the Japanese word, shun, which means at the height of the season, you know, it's not just the spring or the summer uh, produce, but it could be something that is particularly delicious this month or this week, mm -hmm. right? So it's a surprise. Whenever we go to the market, what's there? And then we come home and go, okay, what can we do with this, right? So that's, that's where the creativity and the fun comes in. 
Yeah, I think that's great. Wonderful. Well, if anyone else has any questions that they wanted to throw into the chat, um, let's see, I can ask a couple more. Um, oh, I was curious. So you mentioned that the purple potatoes specifically are a Peruvian variety. Or do you know of any other potatoes that are grown in Oregon that are um, have Peruvian roots? I know kind of all potatoes, you know, originated right. in, um, right. in the Americas. So, yeah, potatoes are native to Peru. There's about 4,000 varieties in grown in the Andes and uh, indigenous people have cultivated them for thousands of years. Mm -hmm. um, the other one that it's very common, and then of course different countries then uh, created their own variety uh, from those roots. But one that I use a lot, very common, easy to find is the Yukon Gold, right? Which is a, a, a cross, a, a breed that was created in North America um, based on part of the Peruvian yellow potato, the Papa Amarilla. So uh, it's a little bit different, but it does remind me a lot of the yellow potato. And I use that as my go-to for making uh, Peruvian mashed potatoes, which are have no dairy. They have lime juice, olive oil, hot peppers, and citrus. Um, and uh, very creamy, and that can be shaped into, into different appetizers. So yeah, you can, you can go It's one of my favorite, besides the purple. Purple are, when they're in season, those are the ones I always get. Yeah, they're beautiful. Um, let's see, Beth is asking um, if you teach any classes anywhere. Uh, not yet. I used to teach classes at a cooking school when I lived in San Francisco. Um, I moved here to Portland about three years ago, uh, starting a family and working a lot on writing projects and developing recipes. And it's been a thrill to connect with Cooks First and Farmers Markets to contribute some recipes and now this, this video. Um, so I would like to do more pop-up events where uh, I cook for people, but also cooking classes. Uh, it's definitely on my radar. It'd be wonderful to find a venue to do that. Of course, it's been challenging with COVID, so uh, maybe I'll try something online, but it'd be really wonderful to do it in person. Wonderful. And then Jerry has another question um, asking about the hot peppers. Can you find those ones at the farmer's market? Great question. Yeah. So one thing that I, that I mentioned in the video is that, uh, one philosophy that I have is the importance of using local ingredients. Um, you know, when, uh, when you're an immigrant, especially you miss the food from your country and you, you it's tempting to try to import everything, right? The exact hot pepper, the exact lime juice, the exact potato. Uh, but I think that defeats the purpose of, of sense of place, of cooking where you are, right? I think it's possible to cook Peruvian food in Oregon with ingredients from the Pacific Northwest. It certainly is possible, right? People do that all the time. So it's, it's rooted in a country, but it has a sense of place that is here. And so to answer your question about the ají amarillo, yes, I've seen it at Montevilla Farmer's Market. We, we bought some starters uh, last year. Um, you can get, of course, imported ají amarillo paste uh, from Peru at, I think, at Mercado in Portland carries it. But uh, a shout out to Nikki Guerrero from Hot Nama Salsa. She makes ají amarillo sauce. So the ají amarillo that I used for my recipe and for the video, uh, I got at uh, the Portland Farmer's Market at her booth. So it, it's local, it's grown here, originally from Peru, but it's got that Portland terroir, that Oregon terroir, and now it's in the uh, cooking sauce that I made. And I, I love that you said that you bought the hot pepper starts yourself. So you also have a garden where you grow some of your food? Yes, yes. So we, uh, it's, it's only been one season so far in our garden here. Uh, and we've tried uh, potatoes, of course, uh, corn, uh, lots of other veggies. Um, we're excited about hot peppers and see, we'll see what we can find, start as we can find uh, this spring and, and get started on that. Yeah, it's exciting. Longer days and plant starts will pop, start popping up at the markets. Um, 
Cool. I think that's all of the questions that we have. Um, thank you so much, Nico, for being here with us. If you wanted to give a, a quick plug of where people can find you and connect with you, um, that'd be great. Yeah, absolutely. I think uh, Cook first posted uh, on their Facebook Live, but uh, my handle on Instagram is at Pisco Trail. That's P I S C O T R A I L. I also have a newsletter uh, on Substack called La Yapa. That's two words L A Y A P A. And La Yapa is a catch up word that means a little something extra, kind of like a baker's dozen, right? So my newsletter, it's a little something extra that I, that I want to give to people interested in my stories and my recipes. Um, it's free to subscribe. I, I publish about once a month. Um, and then I also have a blog, uh, a website where I collect recipes and links to articles that I publish. And that's piscotrail.com, P-I-S-C-O-T-R-A-I-L.com. Thank you. Wonderful. Thanks so much. And thanks, Swing, um, for our happiness again. Yeah, absolutely. So glad to. Thank you both. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye. Thank you, everyone, for joining. Bye for now. Thank you.